What, can you just explain to me what you think the role of Media Watch is? Well, I think the role of Media Watch, uh, essentially, is to keep them honest uh, as far as it can and within the boundaries, of course, of entertainment because you don't want to bore people uh, to tears every Monday night. Um, but it's to keep journalists as honest as we possibly can by keeping our eye across everything that we possibly can. And it's a very difficult job. I don't think anybody really understands how difficult it is, and not be just because of the, the breadth of material, um, but also sometimes because some of the issues of, uh, of um, misbehaviour are very complex. Do you think Media Watch has helped elevate journalistic standards? Uh, it's whether or not Media Watch has elevated journalistic standards is a question that I'm often asked. I think in those sections of the media which watch Media Watch and give a damn about their reputation, then yes. Uh, there are clearly some sections of the media that really don't care at all what Media Watch thinks. And uh, if they happen to appear in the program, they, you know, where it is a bit of a badge of honour and they move on, they keep on doing what they're doing. So I guess the short answer is yes and no. Now, we keep getting told that there's no program in the world like Media Watch that criticises its own ABC programs as well as the commercials. Do you, th do you agree with that? Is it unique? Well, uh, the BBC has a program that criticises BBC material as well, uh, but there aren't many of those kind of programs. So I think, yes, I think it's a fair enough thing to say that Media Watch is a unique program. It has never shied away from criticising ABC programs, radio and television, online material, criticising ABC personnel. Uh, it, it has never shied away from doing that. Naomi Robson's coverage of Beaconsfield. Peter McAvoy says that Naomi lost sight of the fact the story was about two men trapped in a mine. And he said you did a great job at bursting that sort of egotistical bubble. Naomi Robson was, in many senses, perfect media watch fodder. Uh, she constantly made herself the story. What's the value of shining a light on that sort of behaviour? Well, I, I, one of the things that I... One of the things that I really enjoyed about presenting Media Watch uh, and doing the, you know, the background material in order to get a show to air was actually pulling some of those stories apart. So if you began to look at a story that had been put to air by Today Tonight or by A Current Affair, the tabloid television programs, uh, and you started from where they started from and follow the thread all the way through, you could see the degree of misrepresentation uh, that had occurred oftentimes. And uh, that was what was interesting to present to a viewing audience. This is how these people put stories together. So watch and be cautious, watch and beware, watch and know. And, um, and I, I think that's one of the great benefits, really, of a show like Media Watch. Naomi wasn't alone. There was also David Rain that provided many foot-in-the-mouth moments. Oh, David Rain. David Rain, I, I think that um, quite possibly Media Watch could have opened every week, month after month, with a blooper from David Rain. Um, David seemed to just have that foot and mouth disorder and uh, he played to it. Of course his best one, the one that we ran, well I suppose it was one of his best ones, the one that we ran to air was uh, where he didn't know what a placebo was. And it was hilarious, it was very very funny. Uh, and you, you kind of felt a little bit sorry for him. Um, but it, then again, you can't afford to feel too sorry for too many people if you're doing Media Watch. But uh, it was such a, a shocking era and such a funny one that you couldn't resist it, really. How could you not run it? People might say, look, looking at David Rain's a bit, you know, farcical, a bit petty. What's the value? Is it pure entertainment value? I think what people don't realise is that um, regardless of the seriousness of a show like Media Watch and its public importance, uh, it is also a TV show. It also has to entertain. It also has to keep people watching. You don't get 750,000 plus viewers every week by churning out stodgy, deadly serious material week in, week out. You can't do it. It's television. I mean, it has to be entertaining as well 
as, as serious and, and discursive and analytical. And so clearly we would also look to, you know, funny mistakes. Now, can you talk about one of the great gotchas? And that was the Sydney Telegraph's needle exchange story. That story that the Daily Telegraph had run about the box of uh, syringes, used syringes that it had allegedly found outside the needle exchange office in King's Cross in Sydney, was a very important story, largely because it turns out that the needles uh, were not discarded by the needle exchange office at all. They had been discarded by somebody who lived in the cross around the corner the syringes had been used by him to administer insulin to his diabetic cat called Trotsky and um, he was moving house and he placed the box of syringes outside his apartment block in order to dispose of them and went down to dispose of them and they were missing. Well they'd clearly been picked up by somebody and I don't know who and then they miraculously appeared in the pages of uh, the Daily Telegraph as a photograph. So it was a pretty important story, particularly as the editor of the Daily Telegraph, David Pemberthy, the editor at the time, he is no longer the editor, had been uh, talking on radio and running a campaign in the paper and in his interviews on radio about how bad it was and how everybody hated having the needle exchange program up and running in the cross, how dangerous it was for locals. So it kind of blew the lid off that. But I think what was most amusing, if there's an amusing side to that story, is the fact that when uh, we confronted David with... Um, our discovery, um, his response to it was that, um, well, so what? I mean, they may have belonged to Trotsky the diabetic cat, but it doesn't, it doesn't detract from the point that the, that the locals in the cross don't like having the needle exchange program up and running in King's Cross. So he kept at it. I mean, a real warrior. What does that sort of campaigning, media campaigning on a, a sensitive social issue really say? I think what it says essentially about a newspaper or a radio station, and we've caught radio stations doing it, all, doing it as well, is that it is mightily dangerous when a media organisation decides to take on a political issue and prosecute it um, on, on uh, circumstantial evidence that oftentimes doesn't hold up. Um, it is extremely dangerous and it is unfair and it is wrong, it is morally bankrupt because it doesn't give their audience uh, all the information, it doesn't give them fairness, it doesn't give them accuracy, it just delivers a political message. Okay, can you explain who Andrew Bolt is and how he at one point suggested that maybe someone like him, a, a me, would be a good media watch presenter instead of a David Marr? Andrew Bolt is a very, very well-known Herald Sun columnist uh, who um, for a long time has been having a bit of a go at Media Watch and those of us who've worked on it. Um, he once suggested that a me would be better than a David Ma or whoever. Of course, he believes that every presenter of Media Watch has come from uh, the left of the spectr political spectrum. Um, and look, you know, Andrew Bolt might well be very well suited to Media Watch and I see no reason if Andrew Bolt could prove that he was able to put his political um, uh, predilections to one side why he ought not to Media Watch. Why not? Um, I think what's important about Media Watch is that you're prepared to look at each and every instance of media misbehaviour on its merit. Now Andrew Bolt says that the, most of the Media Watch presenters have um, you know, left leanings or are sympathetic to the left and this comes out in the, the material that's presented every week. Well, he's wrong. Andrew Bolt is wrong. I don't believe he knows what the political leanings of most of the you know, past Media Watch presenters have been. And if he does, well, what does he base that on? What evidence does he have? I'd, I'd love to know how, if, he, if, he knows, if he thinks he knows how I vote. Andrew Bolt claims that he was attacked by you on Media Watch for his views on climate change. And it was his views that really offended you. It was not Andrew Bolt's views that offended me. He's entitled to his views. He's entitled to present those views in the pages of his newspaper and in particular in his own personal column and on his blog attached to the newspaper online. Um, but what he has a, a duty to do is to present them accurately and on this occasion he did not. 
he cited an academic paper written by somebody who had retracted the paper and retracted the paper before Andrew Bolt wrote his column. Now just on that, um, Andrew, what he says is, I'll, I'll read it to you. Andrew Bolt says, Media Watch only focuses on the mistakes by climate change sceptics, not by its supporters. Andrew Bolt, again, is wrong. He clearly has not seen every program that I put to air with Media Watch, if that's what he thinks, and that's what he's saying now. Media Watch in 2007, in the first half of the year, I can't name you the exact program dates, but in the first half of 2007, Media Watch put to air several criticisms of the pro-climate change lobby. One of those concerned polar bears, and that is one of, his, uh, the, one of the newspapers of his own stable had actually published a photograph of what it, the caption said was a distressed polar bear clinging to a melting uh, piece of ice. And it turns out, we found out from the photographer, who happened to be Australian and working abroad, that the photograph she had taken was taken in summertime, and the polar bear was not distressed. It was on Media Watch. We also put to air uh, a critique of photographs which were published on the front page of the Fairfax newspapers, and in particular the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, before and after photographs taken during um, Earth Hour, the campaign run jointly by Fairfax and WWF, where people are meant to turn their lights off for an hour and the photographs were meant to describe what Sydney looked like before and what Sydney looked like during the, the turn off of lights and the photos were clearly not what they purported to be and that was also on Media Watch. Now Peter McAvoy spoke yesterday about Mark Scott's speech um, and you actually covered it in an episode of Media Watch. Mark Scott um, said he'd encouraged the director of ABC TV to work with the Media Watch team to review their format and contact next year to ensure there was more opportunity for debate and discussion around contentious and important issues. Did the format that next year of Media Watch change in any way? It did change. We introduced uh, recorded responses. Media Watch has had responses since um, the end of the Littlemore era. Littlemore didn't have responses. It, they were introduced after Littlemore left the program. So they've been there for donkey's years. Um, what we introduced in 2007 was recorded television responses, which I think kind of lifted the program a little bit. Um, but essentially, editorially, no, the program didn't change. I mean, the responses had been there. They were still there after Mark Scott's um, comments. They were in a different form. Um, but the program was doing in 2007 what it had done in 2006 and 2005 and 2004 and all the way back. Nothing really changed in that respect um, and nor could it. Yeah, could you talk about the sort of the, le the mood and the lead up, the criticisms of the program that led to Mark Scott making this speech at the Sydney Institute? I don't think that there were any specific criticisms in that lead up uh, which made Mark Scott say what he said. I think the criticisms of Media Watch had gone back donkey's years and they were particularly intense during David's era. Um, and they continued with Liz and they continued with me. Um, they, and they will no doubt start up again sometime soon in the future. That's just the nature of the program. People don't like to be criticised and that's what the program says. Everyone loves it until they're on it. Um, what caused Mark Scott to say what he said? I, I don't know. You'd have to ask Mark Scott. Um, we certainly were shocked and surprised by it, a tad dismayed, um, because it made an already difficult job a little harder. Um, but we were determined that Media Watch would remain Media Watch, and it did. Terrific. Okay. Now, just to the Brisseton. Off the, on the record, off the record. Uh, what was that whole controversy about, in a nutshell? The EP of Media Watch at the time, Tim Palmer, had decided that he didn't want to cover it because 
he felt that it had been so widely discussed in the week before our pro we went to air, I think the story broke on a Monday, um, that it, there was nothing really new for us to say. I felt that we ought to have canvassed the issues, given a rendition of the facts as we knew them, um, and perhaps thrown up a few questions for people to think about. There was furious discussion about it in our office, and it went on for the entire week. In the end, we didn't put anything to air because we couldn't agree on whether we ought to put it to air. That's simply the nature of program making at times, and it's simply a function of, I think, what is a, a normal creative tension between presenters and EPs, particularly on programs that are as enormously stressful as Media Watch. Um, I wish to date that we'd put something to air. I think it was a mistake that we didn't. But we didn't, and that's all there is to it. Now, the Australian have criticised Media Watch to use this as a bit of a baton. What the Australian have said is that it's a further example of Media Watch not being willing to criticise its own. I find it extraordinary. I found it extraordinary that the Australian could assert that that was an example of Media Watch not wanting to criticise its own. I, there were very few programs, actually, um, where Media Watch didn't criticise the ABC. Uh, we have criticised our own, which is difficult and painful at times, but we have and we do criticise our own all the time. How the Australian could say uh, with a straight face that this is an example of how we're incapable or unwilling to do it is beyond me. Okay. Um, in a nutshell, what was the Media Watch story about on Alan Jones and the Cronulla riots? Why did you criticise Jones's coverage? Well, we criticised Alan Jones's coverage because it was blatantly um, vilification. I don't think you could, you could have heard a clearer example of it. Alan Jones had gone to air and allowed a lot of talkback callers to put a lot of talkback callers to air. Many of them were making essentially racist comments, which he at times appeared to be endorsing and fueling to an extent with his own, uh, with his own comments and his own views. Um, uh, we found them particularly shocking and we re-aired them and criticised him for it. And of course, every time you criticise Alan Jones, you'll cop a fair whack back in return. But um, he subsequently was... Uh, uh, before the um, before ACMA, the Broadcasting Authority, on a complaint um, put into ACMA by a listener, and the uh, the authority took eight months, I think, or perhaps slightly more, to come up with a determination. And the determination was that two uh, GB staff ought to be put through a self-monitored um, anti-vilification course, which um, I believe happened. But it seemed like a terribly, terribly paltry uh, uh, result for such a, a blatantly racist violation. What it does, pandering to those sort of uh, base sentiments, uh, it, gives, it gives a broadcaster audience. It gives them enormous clout. You have somebody at home saying, drinking their cup of tea, saying, yep, that's right, I agree with that. I've seen that. I've seen that in my local shopping centre. And I agree with that. It's wrong. I don't know why they wear those headdresses. You know, I don't know why they eat that food. Um, I don't know why they have those haircuts. Uh, you know, it appeals to people on any number of levels because they see other people around them who've come in who are different and who look different and who sound different. And they are trying to come to grips with that. And sometimes they can't. And sometimes people do need a little bit of help with that. And instead, what they might get is incitement to make sure that the difference is even greater through lack of understanding. And I think what Alan Jones did in that case and, and, and has done on other occasions is to pander to that and to fuel it. And I think it's wrong. Does it 
surprise you that Alan Jones, right back from the days of Littlemore, through every presenter, has just been this constant repeat offender? Does it surprise me that Alan Jones has been a repeater, a repeat offender on Media Watch? No, actually. Alan Jones is a very strong character. He's a, he's a very, very opinionated man. And his opinions have earned him a lot of friends in high places. And when you have that sort of backing and support, you become even surer of your own ideas and your own convictions. And you are even more prepared to air them. Um, and you take more risk and you push the envelope a little bit further and further and further every time you do. So no, I, I'm not surprised that he has appeared on Media Watch so very many times, not at all. Last question. Um, during your time at Media Watch, did you observe any particular trends in the media landscape? Many. We observe, I observed many trends in the media landscape during my time at Media Watch. I, I, I think the most significant was probably the, the, the race to the gutter of uh, the online newspapers, you know, the, particularly the Sydney Morning Herald competing with the Daily Telegraph to be as, as base as it could possibly be and using celebrity journalism to kind of bolster that. Um, so it gets to the ridiculous stage where, you know, the Daily Telegraph can, you know, run pictures of some actresses' breasts and, you know, the, the story is all about, you know, how big they are and have they gotten bigger and you just wonder why, how could you possibly justify putting that on your online newspaper site? It's ridiculous, it's offensive, um, but they do. And I think the thing that struck me most in the time that I was doing Media Watch was the race to, to get to the gutter how far, how fast we could all get there and how many people we could take along with us. There was a time when the Sydney Morning Herald Online used to have its little video box and every video was a celebrity video or a kind of a freak show of some description. Um, and again, it's all about getting the clicks. It's all about the number of clicks because the number of clicks will determine the number of paid advertisers who will come on board and uh, I think that's been the saddest thing about the online development the movement to, you know to electronic media which is a fabulous thing in many respects but it really has brought down the level of Australian journalism <laughs>